Sister Mary Liu, NTUC President, Brother Ng Ji Ming, Secretary General, Brother Dr. Robert Yap, President of SNEF, comrades from the PAP, and brothers and sisters from the labor movement. A very good morning and a very happy May Day to all of you. Whether you are in the hall, whether you are at home, whether you are Zoom or physically present, happy May Day. I am very happy to join you in person to mark May Day this year. I was last year two years ago. Last year, we couldn't do it. The rally took place virtually during the circuit breaker. This year, our COVID situation is better, and we can gather together, although in smaller numbers than usual, and safe management and distance, and each one with a different colored tag. But whatever it is, we are here together. And it's important for us to do this because this year is special. It's the NTUC's 60th birthday. Happy birthday, NTUC. <laughs> NTUC's founding is closely intertwined with the Singapore story. Many of Singapore's founding leaders began their political lives in the trade unions or fighting alongside them. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself launched his political career by representing the Postal Workers' Union in the Postman Strike in 1952. And when Mr. Lee and his colleagues founded the PAP in 1954 to fight for independence from the British, several unionists were among the first members. The next year, Mr. Lee stood for election in Tanjung Paga. The postman mobilized to support him and helped to give him his first election victory. After Singapore achieved self-government, the fight between the non-communists and the pro-communists heated up. The unions became a battleground. In 1961, the pro-communist group broke away from the PAP to form a separate party, the Barisan Socialists. And the trade union movement also split. Out of nearly 100 unions, 82 supported the Barisan Socialists. But 12 unions, 12 stalwart unions, stood by the PAP. They got together and they formed the NTUC. And that's how the NTUC was born. And that's why this year we are celebrating the 60th birthday. Persuading unions to join the NTUC was a tough proposition. It needed steel and guts. But a small group of union leaders battled against the tide. They were led by Devon Nair and Ho Si Bing. And another stalwart was Mahmoud Awang, who became the chairman of NTUC's Pro Tem Committee. Encik Mahmoud came from the STC Employees Union, the Singapore Traction Company Union, one of the 12 which joined the NTUC. Later, he became a PAP Legislative Assemblyman, and then after independence, a PAP MP. Long after he retired, Encik Mahmoud would still come to gatherings of old PAP MPs, until recently. And I was very privileged to have the chance to meet him and get to know him there. Sadly, Encik Mahmoud passed away this year in January, but we remember him warmly and will always keep him in our hearts. The founding PAP and NTUC leaders forged deep bonds of comradeship in the crucible of struggle, first fighting against communism and later against communalism, which led to separation from Malaysia and independence. 
These bonds were tested again in the early years of independence. In 1967, the British announced their intention to withdraw all their military forces from Singapore. Meanwhile, widespread industrial strife was deterring foreign investment. It meant an economic crisis was coming. The government had to act quickly to foster a more conducive environment for investments and to create jobs. So it introduced new laws which restored to employers their rights to hire and fire their employees and curtail the union's powers. Not surprisingly, the unions found this difficult to accept. But the government worked with NTUC leaders to assure workers that their basic rights would be protected and that this was the right thing to do for workers. But not everyone was persuaded, and the perception grew that unions were no longer effective. In four years after independence, union membership fell by nearly a quarter. So the NTUC faced a pressing challenge to fight for its own relevance and existence. And in 1969, the NTUC held the Modernization Seminar. It was a turning point. The aim was not just to arrest the decline of union membership, but to look forward to define NTUC's role in an industrialising new economy, an industrialising Singapore. The stakes were high. Devon Nair chaired the seminar, and he said the labour movement was caught in a race between modernisation and extinction. Either you modernise, transform yourself, or you perish and go extinct. He argued that workers were ultimately interested in salaries and bonuses, not in strikes, not in a communist state. Therefore, unless the labour movement reformed itself, it would fall short of its responsibility, which was to improve the lives of workers. This modernisation seminar was a pivotal moment in the history of the NTUC. Both PAP ministers and NTUC leaders were convinced that a revitalised and forward-looking union movement would be the right partner for the government to build a better future. A strong labour movement would spur workers to give their best, fully confident that they would receive their fair share as Singapore grew and prospered. And indeed, this was what happened. NTUC's refreshed mission ushered in a new era of industrial relations, based not on confrontation, but collaboration. As part of its new mission, NTUC launched social enterprises. It set up cooperatives like Income and Fair Price, as well as childcare centres at a time when there was no market for these services. It was doing national service, but also meeting its members' needs. The employers played their part too, treating the unions as partners and not as adversaries. They formed later the Singapore National Employers Federation. From the union point of view, this was the employers' trade union. SNEF celebrated its 40th anniversary this year. So a week ago, they had a formal celebration. DPM Heng Sui Kiat attended. But today, I think we should not miss this chance to wish SNEF and brother Robert Yap a happy 40th anniversary too. Only in Singapore do such things happen.
Our unique tripartite model has supported decades of sustained, rapid economic growth for Singapore and seen us through many rough spots. In 1985, Singapore encountered our first major recession. I was then at MTI. The Secretary General was Mr. Ong Teng Cheong. As the situation worsened and the clouds darkened, we gathered the union leaders at the conference hall. It was a somber meeting. Mr. Ong and I spoke to them. We had a very hard message to convey. We explained how grave things were, how our business costs had got out of line and made Singapore uncompetitive, and why drastic action was needed, including cutting the CPF by 15 percentage points and implementing wage restraint. Many dialogues followed. Other ministers and union leaders joined in to persuade workers of what we needed to do. The workers could see the job losses for themselves, the cancelled orders. They understood the message. They accepted the bitter medicine. But ultimately, they supported the tough measures not because of our explanations, but it was also because that generation of union leaders, including Mr. Ong Teng Cheong, had earned their trust. And so they walked to him. Fortunately, the medicine worked faster than expected, and by the next year, the economy was already picking up again. That unforgettable experience, unforgettable for those of us who went through it, reinforced the bonds between the government and the unions, as well as with the employers too. It was a powerful demonstration of tripartism at work, and it convinced many more MNCs to invest in Singapore, which created more good jobs for Singaporeans. Subsequent generations of government, union and business leaders have sustained these bonds. Government has kept faith with the workers. We restored CPF rates whenever economic conditions permitted. Employers played their part. They shared the pain in economic downturns. They prioritised jobs. They treated retrenchment as a last resort. Union leaders cooperated with the government and with employers to find solutions to difficult problems in the crisis and afterwards. For example, in the 1990s, we needed to restructure the power industry. This was a complex effort which took a decade. We hived off the electricity department from the Public Utilities Board. We corporatized it. It became Sing Power and subsequently restructured it into different pieces, the Gencos, the power grid, the gas company. We built a more efficient industry to deliver more reliable and affordable electricity supplies to our industries and to our homes. Singaporeans benefited from the results, but the restructuring had a major impact on the workers in the power industry. It was very disruptive, very upsetting, very difficult for them. I was still overseeing MTI at the time. I worked closely this time with the PUB Staff Union and the PUB Daily Rated Employees Union. Later, the two merged to form UPage, the Union of Power and Gas Employees. The union leaders worked hard to persuade their members and to help those who were affected by the changes. The late brother Nitin Nandan from PUB DRE Union played a crucial role. So did brother Nachapan, Nachi, from the PUB Staff Union. Brother Nachi sadly left us earlier this year. He and I stayed in touch all these years. He would update me on how things were in the power industry as it went through ups and downs. He would watch my speeches and press conferences and regularly send me messages of feedback and support. Whether it was New Year, whether it was May Day, I would hear from him 
and exchange greetings and update one another. Even after he retired, Brother Nachi continued imparting his knowledge and experience to younger unionists. He showed them how to champion workers' interests while building trust with employers and the government to achieve win-win outcomes. We need more union leaders like him. The tripartite partners overcame many major recessions and crises together. They happened regularly at least once every decade. We went through the Asian financial crisis, we endured SARS, we were hit by the global financial crisis. Each time the trust between workers, businesses and government held and proved crucial. And each time we knew it will happen again. And we will need this trust. And now we are in COVID-19. Going through the crisis not of a decade, but of a generation. But if we look back at the record of how we have overcome past crisis, COVID-19 doesn't look quite so daunting. This last year, NTUC's dedication to its mission has truly come to the fore. You protect workers in every way. When retrenchments were unavoidable, for example, in the aviation industry or in banking, the unions ensured that retrenchments were carried out fairly and responsibly. Recently, I met some unionists preparing for this while I was preparing for this rally. They shared with me their experiences helping retrenched workers it wasn't easy for them. They felt a sense of mission, cushioning the blow for the affected workers, helping them get back on their feet, helping them find and settle into new jobs. Union leaders worked hard to help the workers make full use of all the government schemes available. The Job Support Scheme, JSS. Now the Jobs Growth Initiative, JGI the Self-Employed Income Relief Scheme, SIRS. And you encourage workers to take the long view, to accept immediate sacrifices, to keep their businesses going, to make it easier for employers to hold on to their staff. Because of your efforts, although this downturn was worse than any we had ever gone through before, our local employment didn't plunge. It went down a little bit, unemployment went up. Now unemployment is coming down again. And our employment numbers, in fact, have gone up a little bit compared to where they were at the beginning. So today on May Day, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all our brothers and sisters. for your tireless efforts over the past year, for your never-say-die spirit, which has helped us come through COVID-19 together. Looking ahead, our economic outlook has brightened considerably. The global recession has been less protracted than we initially feared. Europe still has a problem struggling to contain COVID-19. But the U.S. is expected to make a strong recovery on the back of a large stimulus package and good progress vaccinating, vaccinating its population. China's economy is performing strongly too, and these external trends give us confidence in our own prospects. Earlier, MTI forecast that we would make 4 to 6 percent growth this year. Barring a setback to the global economy, and provided our domestic COVID situation remains stable, there's a very good chance we can achieve 6 percent or better this year. 
But of course, even 6% only brings us back to where we were before COVID hit us. And some sectors like aviation and tourism will not recover soon. And now we see new, stra new strains of COVID emerging. And we are watching our own situation and it can easily, quickly turn bad again. After a long period when we had very few community cases, in the last few days, several new community clusters have emerged, some quite big and worrying. The government is doing everything we can to prevent these clusters from spreading in the community. And we will have to be agile and decisive in our response to tighten measures promptly where it's necessary to clamp down on the spread and to avoid going into a second circuit breaker. I hope Singaporeans will work with us and not let down our guard. It is not time to relax yet. This is a marathon. Let's keep jogging. Let's keep ourselves safe. Don't make the mistake which other countries have done. Celebrate too early. Relax too fast. Let your guard down. Cause another wave to come, very often worse than the first. And more nasty, drastic measures become necessary. If we have to do another lockdown like last year's circuit breaker, it would be a major setback for our people and for our economic recovery. Let's not make it happen. One factor that has helped us keep COVID under control is the unremitting efforts and sacrifices of our workers. Our healthcare workers have been on the front line. They've been testing, vaccinating, treating patients, going beyond the call of duty to keep everyone safe. Thank you for your dedication and courage. Our aviation workers have had their livelihood severely impacted. Passenger flights remain mostly grounded. But cargo flights are still flying, and many workers have returned to man these flights. But you don't need so many air crew to serve and to smile on these flights. So quite a number of air crew have joined the fight against COVID-19. They've become patient care ambassadors, contact tracers, safe distancing ambassadors. Where they go, people say, I can recognize that. That's the Changi style. That's the SIA standard. But they have made a contribution. They have made themselves invaluable. Now we've set up a secure system for testing and isolating passengers arriving in Singapore. And almost all our frontline workers have been vaccinated. And we are making steady progress vaccinating all of Singapore residents. So with these conditions falling into place, we will be able to open up travel safely, step by step, especially to lower risk countries. The aviation business itself still has a long way to go before full recovery, but at last we are catching glimpses of light at the end of the tunnel. Our construction workers have experienced COVID-19 at ground zero. We must continue to ensure their well-being, health and safety, whether on the work sites, whether in the migrant worker dormitories, or travelling to and from work. Some are Singaporeans, some are migrant workers. All of them are our brothers and sisters. And we look after all of them. We've put out the huge outbreak in the dormitories and we've got everybody back to work. But the safe management measures which are still necessary have burdened the industry. And the manpower crunch because some of the migrant workers have gone home has added to its problems. 
projects have been delayed, costs have gone up. And recently, we have had to ban travellers from India, and that has made the situation worse for the construction industry. We are working on emergency legislation to address this severe disruption and to share the burden more fairly between the different parties, the contractors, the developers, and the buyers. And we will introduce the legislation, I hope, in the next sitting of Parliament. I've mentioned just three of our sectors which are particularly affected, but in all other sectors, workers have been affected by COVID-19 too. Some more, some less, but nobody has been left untouched. Throughout this crisis, the government has provided relief and grants to help companies tide over the recession. Across last year and this year, we are drawing more than $50 billion from our past reserves to support businesses and workers. It's an unprecedented draw. But as the economy recovers, we have to recalibrate our support to be at a more sustainable level. When I met the union leaders, I asked, how are things? They all told me that JSS is marvellous. Then I knew what they were going to say next. They said, they asked, please, sir, can JSS be extended longer? I said, we would think about this carefully, but please remember, JSS is artificial life support. It keeps us breathing for a while, but it doesn't cure us, and it doesn't last forever. We must find a way to fully recover, to get back on our feet, to build new muscles, to move Singapore forward again. We must prepare ourselves for life after COVID-19. What will life after COVID-19 be like? We don't know for sure, but we can already see some trends. Trends which the pandemic has accelerated. For example, we talk about digitalization, we talk about automation, we talk about sustainability. These are words you've heard many times, I'm sure, over the last few months, from the SecGen, from the Central Committee, from ministers, in the newspapers, what do they mean? Digitalization, automation, sustainability. Let me give you one concrete small example of each one so you understand what we are talking about, what we are trying to do, why I think we can do it. First of all, digitalization. For years, we've encouraged hawkers tried to encourage hawkers to go digital without very much success. Many hawkers didn't know what this was, didn't think it was worth the investment, given their small scale. Besides, their customers were used to queuing up at the hawker centres to order and then to pay in cash. But when we were forced into the circuit breaker last year, many hawkers had no choice but to adopt digitalization. What did they do? They went online. An entrepreneurial second generation hawker, Melvin Chu, set up a Facebook group called Hawkers United, Tapao 2020, to help the hawkers to advertise online. The software engineer created take.sg a simple order form on WhatsApp to make it less daunting for older hawkers to take their businesses online. Other hawkers jumped on the platforms of food delivery companies like Grab, Deliveroo, Food Panda. So now whether you want Cha Kui Tiao or Roti Prata, you can get it from more than 1,300 hawkers who offer online delivery. And in fact, if you want to pay e-payments, more than half of all hawkers have adopted e-payments. 
so that even if you are queuing up at the hawker stall, chances are you can e-pay using a QR code. So that's digitalization. Not the end of it, but one step forward. Secondly, automation. What's that? If you own a dog or a cat, you probably have heard of Pet Lovers Centre. It's Singapore's oldest and largest chain of pet supplier stores. During the circuit breaker, all 70 of its retail stores had to close. But online orders surged because the pets circuit breaker or no circuit breaker, need to eat, need to poo, need to change their litter baskets and have to be supplied. So to cope, the Pet Lover Centre quickly developed a new system to track their inventory. And they also upgraded the warehouse with an automated storage and retrieval system with support from Enterprise SG. So employers no longer needed to spend long hours, hot and dusty and sweaty in the warehouse, and manually locating and retrieving items. They just press a few buttons, the robot delivers the item to them, they pack it up, and then it can be sent off. That is automation, and it's helped the company, Pet Lovers Centre, has its productivity and its warehouse capacity more than double. It's made sure to put itself into a stronger position to ramp up its business when the economy picks up. It's helped the staff too, because morale has gone up. Employees have picked up new skills, they are more productive, Life is, the work is more pleasant, they are paid more. So that is automation. Again, one example, but it has to be replicated thousands and thousands of times across our economy, across our whole society. Third, sustainability. Sunseep, Sunseep, it's a company. It's a clean energy solutions provider based in Singapore. It's installing one of our largest floating solar farms in the Straits of Johor, off Woodlands. Installing solar panels is a skilled technical job. It pays quite well, but it's also hard outdoor work under the sun. So, in Singapore, it's mostly done by foreign workers. But like other companies, Sunseep faced a manpower crunch during COVID-19. The CEO told me that his response was to do a bit of redesign of the job get support from NTUC and train young Singaporeans to take up these jobs as solar technicians and engineers. And it helped that the young Singaporeans are enthusiastic about climate change and renewable energy. And they know that these fields are going to become increasingly important parts of our economy. So, new jobs have been created, sustainability takes a step forward, and we make progress. Digitalization, automation, sustainability. These are new trends. We have to get ahead of them. Then we can seize the opportunities which will come and create new and better jobs for our people. But for our workers to benefit, they have to have the right skills. Every May Day rally, I lecture again and again about lifelong learning. The government is investing heavily in skills future. We will spend about $1.4 billion over the next few years. So this year, I'd just like to remind everybody, please use your skills future credits. Take a course, learn something useful, make yourself more employable, more productive, more secure. The NTUC is a critical partner for the government to transform our workforce. E2I is doing good work building up our training ecosystem. Beyond that, NTUC has recently formed more than 600 CTCs, company training committees, 
CTCs which identify capability gaps, they create new competencies, they train workers for companies, and they help the workers to gain the skills and capabilities early, ahead of time, so that they can switch into new roles and jobs more easily and not wait until their jobs are at risk by when it's too late. So Sunseep, the solar energy company I talked about, is one company which NTUC worked with to redesign its jobs to become more attractive to Singaporeans. Another company is a hotel, Copthorne Kings. The FDAWU recently worked with a hotel to retrain its staff to pick up new skills. One of these employees was a reservation executive, Elsie Lee. Elsie got trained in security, picked up a security license, so that when tourists dried up, she could be easily redeployed to a new job. The CTCs show how NTUC is making itself relevant to workers. And NTUC will have to continue to reinvent itself because our workforce profile is also evolving. The proportion of PMETs have gone up, as you heard from SecGen just now, from slightly over half our workforce, resident workforce a decade ago, now 60%. The number of gig workers has increased. In three years, more than double, now 70,000 gig workers, which is why there was such a response to the SIR scheme during the downturn. The older worker population has also grown significantly. So, as Brother Ng Chi Meng said, NTUC has been reaching out to these different groups, understand their specific needs, support each one of them with targeted, relevant help. And one of the groups which NTUC is reaching out to and focusing on is lower-income workers. I was very happy to hear SecGen's announcement on the NTUC Foundation, starting off with $250 million. The Foundation will help sustain many NTUC care initiatives that support lower-income workers and their families, especially during difficult times like now, when it's tough to raise funds. Protecting the vulnerable people in our society is, also, is a key priority also of the government. The government has been working with the tripartite partners to extend the progressive wage model to more sectors like food services and retail. And this is not just a theoretical exercise, but a practical, effective strategy to improve the lives of more lower wage workers. And we plan to more than double the number of workers covered under the progressive wage model over the next few years. We are working on some other plans to support lower-income workers too. Zaki is coordinating this from inside MOM. NTUC is involved, and I intend to speak about these plans at the National Day Rally in a few months' time. As NTUC transforms itself, we need to keep the symbiotic relationship between the PAP and the NTUC strong and vibrant. On the ground, party activists work closely with unionists to engage workers directly. Young PAP and young NTUC are doing more activities together. MPs are deployed as union advisors. Our branches and unionists are working together on joint initiatives for example, UK, to help lower-income members and their families. This close connection and joint activity makes sure that we find out quickly and accurately about the concerns and aspirations of workers, and we can work out solutions and improve their lives. In Parliament, the PAP has always had a sizable labour movement, labour movement contingent amongst our PAP MPs. MPs like Desmond Tu and Patrick Tay, who have been MPs now for several terms. And in the last general election, we brought in some new ones, like Fami Aliman and Yo Wan Ling, 
our most recent female MTUC, female MP from the NTUC. Wan Ling is following a well-trodden path. Quite a few of our women MPs have come from the labour movement, like Madam Yu Fu Yishun, Josephine Teo, and Halima Yaakob, now president. I highlight this because a week from now is International Women's Day, and also because this year we are celebrating the Year of the Woman. I hope we'll have many more female MPs, and in particular, many more female labour movement MPs like them. Such a strong and diverse labour contingent ensures that the workers' concerns are well represented in Parliament. At the leadership level, ministers and NTUC leaders work closely together. I regularly meet union leaders. I exchange views with the SecGen on workers' issues. Before I settled my cabinet changes last week, I discussed my plans with him. I asked Brother Po Ji Ming if I could have Po Kun back to return to the government from the NTUC so that he could be appointed to MOM. I explained to Chi Ming that I wanted an office holder in Mom, who is familiar with NTUC, who is NTUC's friend and can help NTUC's work. And in place of Po Kun, I offered to send Chi Hong Tat to NTUC to carry on what Po Kun has been working on these last three years. I'm very glad that Brother Chi Ming, Sister Mary Liu and the NTUC Central Committee agreed. Thank you very much. So I called up Brother Chi Hong Tat and spoke to him, and I'm very glad to report that Brother Chi Hong Tat agreed too. Ever since the Modernization Seminar in 1969, a strong labor movement has been an essential partner in Singapore's progress. In many developed countries, union memberships have been steadily declining. But in Singapore, our labour movement has gone from strength to strength, and the numbers are going up. And during the downturn last year, during COVID-19, the numbers have gone up some more because people know that they need the union in a crisis. COVID-19 has reminded us again how vital a strong labour movement is. As Singapore presses forward into an uncertain world, we must keep our labour movement strong and we must strengthen its bonds with a pro-labour PAP government. The PAP will always stand solidly by the NTUC and by workers. You are the heart of what we do. You are the reason why the PAP was founded, and you are the reason why the PAP exists today. So on your 60th birthday, I not only wish you happy birthday, but I ask you to remain steadfast in NTUC's mission to strengthen your close partnership with the government and to improve the lives of Singapore workers. Whatever storms come our way, and we can be sure this is not the last one, let's make sure Singapore continues to grow and to prosper united and strong for many years to come. Happy 60th anniversary and happy May Day.